In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We welcome you to our Perseverance Family Conversation. Great to be with you. We'd like to start our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And we're preparing to celebrate the great feast day of the Assumption of Mary into Heaven, which will be this coming Sunday. So let's turn to Mary as we enter into our family conversation. And let's uh, pray the prayer that she loves most. That's the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's turn to our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. He's known also as the Paraclete. He's also known as the Sanctifier. Catechism calls him the gift of gifts. He's also known as the sweet guest of our souls. And also he is also known as our counselor as well as our consoler. So as we start this new week, let's uh, ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light in our intellect. Interior joy in carrying out God's obligation. The interior fire of love, which is the greatest of all virtues, love, charity. So let's uh, pray to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to be with us as our friend, our guide, our consoler, our counselor, our help, as we say, Hail Mary, rather, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit. We may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Benedict of the Cross, pray for us. All God's holy men and women, pray for us. Our guardian angels, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So we welcome you to this uh, new week. And um, just a thought about yesterday's readings. And then we'll enter into the riches that God has in store for us today. During the past month, on Sundays, we've been reading through the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. This chapter can be divided into two miracles that Jesus carried out. The multiplication of the loaves and the fish. And then Jesus walks on water. Then in the synagogue of Capernaum, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gets up and he gives a brilliant discourse 
and is the bread of life discourse, which he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. We see that many of the people start to complain about this, saying, how can this man give us his, his flesh to eat? Jesus says, stop murmuring among yourselves. Our Lord is referring to what will happen at the Last Supper. Surrounded by his disciples, he will take bread and wine and say those words that I say every day in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And those words are, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood. The Last Supper was actually the first Mass. Going back to the first reading yesterday, it's a reading that is parallel to the Gospel reading. So in the Sunday Mass, you'll notice, try to be aware of this, that the, the first reading in the Gospel reading has usually the same theme. Yesterday's Mass we had from 1 Kings chapter 19. Which the prophet Elijah is fleeing for his life. He's put to death the false prophets of Baal. And Queen Jezebel is infuriated and makes a, an oath that she will not be at peace until the same thing happens to Elijah. She wants him to be to be killed. So Elijah is fleeing for his life, and after a day's journey, he becomes discouraged. He says, Lord, take my life. I've had enough. He falls asleep underneath a broom tree. Underneath, underneath a broom tree. And his angel wakes him up and says, look, you have to eat. And he gives him bread to eat. Elijah falls asleep. The angel wakes him up again and says, Look, you have to eat. So he eats for a second time the bread that's given to him. And from the energy and strength that's given from that bread, the prophet Elijah, he travels 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything more till he arrives at the holy mountain. the mountain of Horeb, or Mount Sinai, where he encounters God, not in the earthquake or the thunder or the storm, but he encounters God in a gentle breeze. I'd like to just uh, give you the, the primary message of those two readings. And they are that we are like Elijah, we are pilgrims. We're heading toward the holy mountain, which is our eternal reward in heaven. We are surrounded by many enemies. As Elijah was being pursued by his enemies, we have our enemies too. Three of the principal enemies in our lives would be the devil, who is known as the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, we have the world in which we live. And the world can easily seduce us into believing that here we can find true and everlasting happiness. And the flesh, which we carry within ourselves, does not always want to obey the spirit, but its own passions and desires. How are we going to make it to this holy mountain. How are we going to make it to this holy mountain? A car without gasoline is not going to travel. A bird without wings is not going to fly. So it is with us. We do not charge our spiritual batteries, our spiritual gas tank, with the grace of God 
which comes through prayer, your holy hour, but also comes through our sacramental life. And the greatest of all sacraments is the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. We do not frequently nourish ourselves on the bread of angels, on Holy Communion, on the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. We do not do that. Then, like Elijah, we will give up, we'll give in to despair, and we'll lose the battle. So, make it a a, a proposal that will try to go and receive the Eucharist as often as possible and bring our family. That brings me to our intentions. I'd like to pray for all of you starting today, this week, the beginning of this week. Praying for all of you and placing you on the altar. This is called, I like to call it Opus Dei. Opus Dei, which means the work of God. I'll place all of you on the altar that all of us will try to become the best version of ourselves, as Matthew Kelly points out. The best version of ourselves is that of becoming a saint. We'll talk briefly about a saint we have today, then we'll go back into the book of Deuteronomy, as well as the Gospel of Matthew for the, for the day. So, I'd like to pray that all of us would take seriously our pursuit of holiness of life. My second intention, I'd like, to be I'd like to pray for your children. Before long, your children will be returning to school. Some are already returning to school within the next few days. I'd like to pray for your children that they would use this respite, uh, this time that they have off from their academics, to grow, to grow spiritually. Bring them to daily Mass if you can. Maybe a good confession. That they would grow in domestic virtues, helping out at home. That they would grow physically, dedicate themselves to physical activity. That's so important for young people and children. That they would grow intellectually. That they would grow intellectually by applying themselves to good, solid reading. That they would cultivate good friends. Having a good friend or two is important. That they would cultivate their talents, whatever they might be. God has given to us all talents that are are a gratuitous gift from our benefactor in heaven, God. How generous God truly is. And that God, and that we would also cultivate our gifts of communication through writing, through speaking, through poetry. God has given us the ability to communicate. So these are my intentions I'd like to place in your hearts, encouraging you to fight the good fight, run the good race, so that you'll be able to receive the merited reward that God has prepared for you. Okay, my friends, as mentioned earlier, today we're going to talk about a saint we celebrate today. Then we'll go to meeting Moses once again in the book of Deuteronomy. And then we'll encounter Jesus in the Gospel today. My friends, we should have a real hunger for getting to know God's friends, the saints. And these saints are part of our Perseverance family. But also, we should have a real hunger, a real hunger for the Word of God. After Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, the devil tried to tempt Jesus, 
saying to him, If you're the Son of God, why don't you turn those stones into bread? Jesus, quoting the Old Testament, responded to the devil, Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Let's pray that we would have a real hunger for the bread of life, as we mentioned in the readings yesterday. But also we have a real hunger for the Word of God. The bread of life as well as the Word of God. Okay, we celebrate a saint today, a relatively modern saint. And the saint that we celebrate today is a woman who became a nun, and she's a convert, and her name, her birth name is Edith Stein. Stein means rock in German. She was born into a very ortho, an orthodox Jewish family in Germany. And her parents had 11 children. And she was the last of 11 children. And she was uh, born in Breslau, Germany, and now that would be Poland. She's born on October 12th, 1981, which happened to be the Jewish Day of Atonement. The Jewish people have certain feasts, Passover, Tabernacles, and Atonement, Yom Kippur, in which they offer up reparation, sacrifice of reparation for sin. It's kind of like our, our Lent, our, our, our Ash Wednesday, you might say. Edith Stein was an intellectual. She was an intellect. She loved to read. And she was had a very keen mind and liked to read a lot, especially philosophy. She was a professor of philosophy in the School of Phenomenology. Max Scheller would be one of the key teachers of phenomenology, and John Paul II also was studied phenomenology. Something happened, however, that changed her life. She was a voracious reader, and she fell upon the writings of Teresa of Avila. And because of her readings of Teresa of Avila and the grace of God, Edith Stein, she was baptized. One of her greatest sufferings, if not her greatest suffering, was Edith Stein had a great love for her mother. And the fact that Edith Stein became a Catholic against her mother's wishes was one of the greatest sufferings she ever endured. And when she had to tell her mother that she's going to become a Catholic and that pierced the heart of her mother, that pierced the heart of Edith Stein. It was her greatest suffering. Whoever Jesus himself says, whoever loved father, mother, brother, and sister more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, she had to be faithful to her conscience. She had to be faithful to the grace that God had given to her. And after she was baptized, 11 years later, Edith Stein renounced the world and entered into 
the Carmelite convent. And she took a new name because once a woman enters into Carmel, they take a new religious name. And her name was Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. There's a lot in that. She took the name of Teresa of Avila. Benedicta would be that of St. Benedict of Nursia, of the Cross. We have St. John of the Cross, who was a, a Carmelite, known as the Mystical Doctor. Because of the Nazis that were present in Germany and spreading their power throughout Europe, she was sent to the Netherlands for safety. But on August 2nd, 1942, the Gestapo, the Nazis, arrested Teresa and her blood sister Rosa at the Carmel in a place called Echt in the Netherlands. And she died at Auschwitz. She died at Auschwitz on August 9th, which would be today. In her last words to Rosa, before leaving the Carmel were, come, we are going to our people. In 1999, St. John Paul II declared this eminent daughter of Israel and faithful daughter of the church. She became a co-patroness for Europe with St. Catherine of Siena. So this is a great saint. Let's pray to this saint that we would cultivate our minds that we would be faithful to our vocations, that we would be strong when confronted by, by persecution. And that, like this great saint, we would have a great love for prayer, that we'd be faithful to our prayer life. Because once she entered into Carmel, it wasn't really to pursue her studies anymore. Even though she was a brilliant intellect and she was a professor of philosophy, rather she entered into the convent of the Carmelites to seek the face of God and to pursue a life of great holiness, which she attained. She and her sister were placed in the gas chamber about a week after they were taken from the convent in the Netherlands. So let's turn to this great saint and ask for her prayers, that she would, uh, she would help us by her prayers to be faithful to God, to faithful to God in all times and places, knowing that we are weak, but the grace of God is stronger than our weakness. Remember, St. Paul asked the Lord to remove the thorn from his side. He asked him three times, and God said, My grace is sufficient for you. So let's move, my friends, into the, into the Word of God. Over the past few weeks, we've been going through the Old Testament. We've been going through the Pentateuch the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now we've arrived at the book of Deuteronomy. And the central figure, of course, of the Bible is always God, 
However, there are major figures. Two of the, mo the major figures in the Old Testament would be that of Moses and Elijah. Remember last week we celebrated the feast day of the Transfiguration, where our Lord ascends Mount Tabor with Peter, James, and John. He's transfigured before their eyes, and Jesus is speaking to both Moses and Elijah. Moses, the lawgiver, Elijah, the great prophet. So when you come to Moses again, and Moses speaks to the people. And the, the words that Moses addressed to the people many years ago, these words are addressed to you and to me right now. So what is God saying to us through the word of God? The following. Moses said to the people, that means also us. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? What is God asking of us right now? He says, but to fear the Lord your God. To, to, to fear the Lord your God. Many people don't really understand. What does it mean to fear the Lord your God? Well, once we're baptized, we receive within our souls the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But also we receive within our souls the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And among these gifts are wisdom, knowledge, understanding, which perfects the intellect, counsel, fortitude, piety and fear of the Lord, which perfects, perfects the will. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And fear of the Lord is related to humility it is a humble recognition that we are all very weak. We are all very vulnerable. We're all tempted. We're all prone to sin. We can all collapse and fall. St. Therese of Lisieux said this, the reason why I did not fall many times was that God cleared the path for me. We should pray that God would clear the path for us. In a certain sense, when we pray the Our Father, we say, deliver us from evil. And we say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're asking God to be delivered from the devil, but also that God would deliver us from our own weakness, that he would be our strength. So fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then God says, God speaks to us through Moses, in which he says, Fear the Lord your God, and follow his ways exactly. And follow his ways exactly. So God wants us to be faithful to his ways. Exactly. Jesus will go on to say, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Then he says, to love and serve the Lord, your God, with all your heart and all your soul. So both to love and to serve. And those are put together. If we truly 
love God with our hearts, then we're going to be serving God with our hands. That's true. We, we know God in our minds. We love God in our hearts. But then we're called to, we're called to serve God in our hands. If you like, we have to serve God where we're at in our specific vocation, most of us in the context of the family. But we might try to apply this service of God to living out the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. The corporal works of mercy you can find in Matthew chapter 25. And they are, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a foreigner and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you came to visit me. When? Whenever we did that to the least of our brothers, we do that to Christ. So our love for God has to be manifested by the way we serve others. Then God says to Moses to keep the commandments, to keep the commandments of God. My friends, we might even go back today in our free time and go through the commandments. You might even go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which explains the commandments in great detail. The first three commandments refer us to our relationship to God. And the fourth to the tenth refers us to our relationship to others as well as to ourselves. So the first three would be the theological dimension. Then the fourth to the tenth would be the social and personal relationship. Let's just go through, I'm just going to go through the commandments. And you might even do this as a exercise of discipline. If you don't have the commandments memorized, see if you can memorize the commandments. One, I am the Lord your God. You should not have other gods before you. Second is do not take the Lord's name in vain. The third is to keep holy the Sabbath day. Fourth would be honor your father and your mother. The fifth would be thou shalt not kill. Sixth would be thou shalt not commit adultery. Seventh, thou shalt not steal. The eighth, thou shalt not bear, bear false witness against your neighbor. The ninth, thou should not covet your neighbor's wife. And the tenth, thou should not covet your neighbor's goods. Those are the Ten Commandments of God. So my friends, That is a message that comes to us from chapter 10 of Deuteronomy. Is Moses is exhorting the people to fear the Lord, to get to know the Lord, to get to know what the Lord wants of us, to obey the Lord, as well as to love the Lord. And this is also carried out by keeping God's commandments. You know, my friends, holiness, holiness does not depend so much 
on feelings and emotions and sentiments, fine, they're okay, they're neutral. But true love for God is manifested by our willingness to obey the commandments. And that's what Moses is teaching us. God is teaching us through Moses. Jesus says this, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus will go on to say also, Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but those who do the will of my Heavenly Father. So that's our message today. God is inviting us to Moses. He, God is inviting us to Moses to really get to know him and to love him and to serve him. But this, this is done not simply by paying lip service, but by concrete actions, by obeying his commandments. All right, my friends, let's move from the first reading, and I've just gone through about two verses of the first reading, and I just go through one last idea, is that later on, Moses will say, to help out the widow, to help out the immigrant, basically we're called to help out the people in the society that are poor, weak, abandoned, vulnerable, fragile, marginalized. In other words, we have to try to recognize that God is present, especially in the weak, in the sick. And we see this very clearly in the way our Lord treated people. Our Lord came to save all. But we see in the Gospel how Jesus had a special love for those who were weakest. You know, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the paralytics, even the lepers. Jesus, not only would he not shun the lepers, but he actually would touch the lepers. He would touch a leper. And instead of, instead of him contracting leprosy, which leprosy was a contagious, incurable disease 2,000 years ago, by touching the leper, Jesus would, only, would not only not get the leprosy, but he would heal the leper. So in our lives, in our holy hour, in our prayer, we might even ask ourselves, is there someone in our life, in our family, our extended family, at work, our colleagues, our work associates, is there someone that's very weak? There's someone that's stumbling, someone that's crying out help. You're, you are called to be that person to stretch out your hand and to help this person that's sinking in the waves of his own misery. And we hope and pray that you're by serving him, that will be a means by which that will connect him to God. He'll recognize that, hopefully, that God actually sent you as a good Samaritan to help him on the difficult highway of life. 
So those, those were a few ideas that you can meditate upon in the first reading today, which is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, which means second law. All right. The responsorial psalm is taken from Psalm 147. About a week ago, I finished a mini course on the Psalms, in which we're giving five talks on the book of prayer par excellence, which are the 150 Psalms. We have the privilege every day in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass to pray at least a part of one of the Psalms. You have the first reading, and then you have what is called the Responsorial Psalm. And you have the Antiphon. So I'd like to glean one idea from the Psalm for your meditation to enrich your prayer life. It is Psalm 147. Psalm 147. And the antiphon is the following. Praise, praise the Lord Jerusalem. Praise the Lord Jerusalem. That's the antiphon. Okay. Of all the forms of prayer, praise is actually the highest. St. Ignatius of Loyola, in the spiritual exercises, starting off the spiritual exercises with Prince von Foundation, we meditate upon these words. We are created, we are created to praise God to reverence God, to serve God, and by means of that, to save our souls. That's the first line of Prince Mon Foundation, to praise God. These are ways in which we can praise God. You can praise God, my friends, in this way. By praying some of the Psalms. In my course on the Psalms, I pointed out that of the 150 Psalms, the last three Psalms, Psalm 148, 149, and 150, those three last Psalms are Psalms of praise. So allow the Word of God, especially the Book of Psalms, the Book of Prayer par excellence, to help you to enhance your, your life of praise. The second way in which we can praise God is By having devotion to the angels. That's right. Thomas Aquinas divided the angels into different choirs. The highest choir of angels would be the cherubim and the seraphim. In the cherubim and the seraphim, what are they doing? They're in heaven in front of the Blessed Trinity. They're praising the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. So why not invite, starting today, my friends, invite the angels to play a more dominant role in your lives. Ask your guardian angel to protect you from evil, to help you to pray, But ask the angels to give you a spirit of praise. In our church in St. Peter Chanel, 
It's a beautiful church. And there you have the tabernacle. Beautiful gold structure tabernacle. But the tabernacle has an enclosure by these glass windows. And etched into these glass windows are angels. And the angels are kneeling down in the form of praising and worshiping the Blessed Sacrament. Then we, when we expose the Blessed Sacrament, we have adoration every day from 1 o'clock all the way up to the 6 o'clock Mass. We, we enthrone the Blessed Sacrament in the monstrance. In the monstrance you have the two candelabra. And then the two candelabra. Then we have the stand. And on the stand, the beneath the stand, you have angels. Angels that are supporting the stand. These angels are praising God. These angels are praising God. And they're inviting us to praise God. So, my friends, we are created to praise God. And of course, and of course, the greatest means by which we can praise God on earth is by participating, my friends, participating, my friends, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. By participating in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the Opus Dei, the great work of God. One of the most sublime moments in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is called the doxology. The doxology, the word actually means praise. After the bread and wine have been consecrated, and before the Our Father, the priest who represents Christ, Alter Christus. He takes the host in the chalice, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, raises it up. It says, Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. What is happening there? What I just sung, which is the doxology, what is sung, which is the doxology, is the primary purpose of Mass, and our primary purpose on earth, you might even call it a, a Eucharistic principle and foundation, in which we are praising God the Father by the offering of God the Son and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. That's right. We're called to praise God the Father by the offering of God the Son, the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's move, my friends, to the Gospel. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 17, 22 to 27. In the Gospel today, you might divide it into two basic ideas that we can meditate upon. We can assimilate and try to live out.
So Jesus is with his disciples, they, and they're gathering in Galilee. And Jesus is making a prophecy of what is going to happen to him. Last week, Jesus made the prophecy in Caesarea Philippi. He first asks the disciples, who do people say that he is? And some say John the Baptist, another one Jeremiah, another one one of the prophets. And who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son, the living God. Then after confirming this profession of faith of Peter, Jesus says that he's going to suffer at the hands of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the high priests. He'll be put to death. And once again today, Jesus says that the Son of Man is to be handed over to men and they will kill him. But then he says he'll be raised on the third day. The disciples were overwhelmed with grief at hearing this. Overwhelmed at grief. What is the message that maybe God wants to leave in our hearts today through this gospel passage? It might be this. All of us should have a all of us should have a crucifix on our walls in all the bedrooms in ours as well as that of our children and it's a very solitary practice to spend some time contemplating Jesus on the cross and his five wounds And to contemplate these wounds, contemplating his passion death, to actually kiss his wounds, his hands, his feet, and his open heart. And you contemplate the passion of Christ, this should move us to repentance for our sins a firm purpose of amendment to try to give up our sins, but also that we would love Christ, that we would be keenly aware of the fact that he, he suffered on the cross. He went through all of his sufferings because of his love for the whole world, but his love for you and for me. So that's one message I'd like to give as the first part of the gospel. Jesus speaks about his upcoming passion and death. And the second part is you'd have the collectors of the temple tax approach Peter. They ask him, does your teacher pay the temple tax? Now, all Jewish people in Jerusalem, as well as the other parts of the kingdom, they would have to pay a temple tax for the upkeep of the temple every year. So Peter says, yes, our Lord pays the temple tax. So when Peter enters in the home, Jesus right away asks him, Peter, Simon, what is your opinion? From whom do the kings of the earth take tolls or the census tax? From their subjects or from foreigners? And he says from foreigners. Then the subjects are exempt. So that Jesus says, so that they will not be offended Jesus tells Peter to do something that's extraordinary. He tells him to go to Lake Galilee to get a hook, to drop the hook 
And if he, when he drops the hook, Peter will catch a fish. And Peter says that in the, in the mouth of the fish, there will be a coin that is worth double the temple tax. And Jesus says that give it to them for you and for me. It's quite an extraordinary passage that there's going to be there's going to be a coin in the mouth of the fish. A coin in the mouth of the fish. And Peter, of course, was a fisherman. He throw the the hook in and he pull out a fish and he would find that coin in the mouth of the fish. What does this mean for us? Well, one interpretation of this is the following. That we are called to have, we're called to be citizens. Citizens of two different kingdoms. All of us are called to be citizens of heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're called to be citizens of the kingdom of God. That's our primary purpose in life. To be faithful to our baptismal calling to love and to obey God's commandments, as we spoke about earlier, in the words of Moses to us. But also we should try to be loyal and faithful citizens in this world. What does that mean in concrete? Well, you know, we're, even though we don't like to do it, we've got to pay our taxes. We should try to obey the traffic regulations. When the time arrives, we should all try to vote. We are, if we're American citizens, we should try to vote. And I said this many times before. The elections are primary criteria when we cast our vote should be that we should try to defend the innocent. We should defend the unborn child. The unborn child does not have a voice in and of himself. But the voice of the child should be expressed by your voice. By your voice, you are called to defend the innocent child in the womb. He cannot defend himself, but rather you are called to defend that child. So my friends, We've had a very good, very good conversation this morning. And as always, I'd like to end our conversation by imparting to all of you my priestly blessing. You pray for me, and I will pray for you. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of Mary, the Mother of God, of good Saint Joseph, God's angels and saints, and especially today, Saint Benedicta of the Cross, may God bless you in a very, very special way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us praise the Lord by our lives and by our lips. Amen.